What if I told you that the story you've never heard would be the one you'll always remember? When you meet Coach Fry after three minutes, you feel like you've known him 20 years. He has a way of just making you feel comfortable, making you feel at home. He was the first coach that stressed education. Hayden Fry was like the first superstar of us. Hayden Fry took the SMU job with the understanding that he could recruit black players. When Jerry Levias joined the SMU program, he was met with isolation and racism. And I asked him, you know, why did you do that? You know, why did you put your career on the line? He paused for a little bit and he says, you know, I was no longer afraid of the dark. He called me Levi when he loved me. And he called me Jerry when I was in trouble. They really had a great player-coach relationship. They also had something similar to a father-son relationship. You would only have five to 10 black players on the team. It's been well documented, his story with Gary Levias at FMU. Coach Fry had made sure that I had all the exposure that any person would have. There were some uh, threats to Jerry, as well as my dad. You look at Kinnick, how much it's evolved over the last 25, 30 years, it wouldn't be possible without Hayden Fry. <laughs> what if I told you that the story you never heard would be the one you'll always remember? I'm Quinn Early, and this is One. After turning around the North Texas program, Coach Fry signed on to be the Iowa Hawkeyes head coach in 1979. He took a historically bad football program and instilled a culture of winning and new tradition. In 1981, under Fry, the Hawkeyes won a Big Ten championship and earned a trip to the Rose Bowl. Hayden Fry was like the first superstar of Iowa. I mean, he was a larger-than-life figure. Not that he sought the spotlight, but he wasn't uncomfortable in the spotlight. I can see why recruits fell in love with him and the university. There was so much love for him in our state, but equally, there was so much love he had for our state from him. You look at Kinnick, uh, how much it's evolved over the last 25, 30 years. It wouldn't be possible without Hayden Fry. In 1981, I met Coach Fry. You know, he's a very unique individual. Every guy on that staff that was that he had hired, none of us had resumes. None of us had, you know, impressive backgrounds, but he saw something in each and every one of us, I think, that, uh, you know, he felt like he, he could maybe develop and, and maybe bring the best out of us. And uh, I think he did the same thing in recruiting with players. When he hired Kirk Ferentz and myself, we were two of the youngest offensive and defensive line coaches in all of college football. And it sure as hell wasn't because of resume We'd earned it, we deserve it, but he saw things in us that we didn't even see in ourselves. I hear I'm an Iowa City native, love the place. It's my alma mater, and I never got to be a part of a winning season or a bowl game as a player. And here we're going through all the successes as, as players now and coaches and doing it as a football family under Hayden Fry's leadership. The story has been, you know, told a little bit, but my primary reason for coming here was because of Coach Fry mm -hmm. and because what he had done uh, in the 1960s, 64, 65, when he gave the first first African-American kid a scholarship, Jerry Levice. Jerry Levice, yep. At about that time, I had some 90 to 100 scholarships, and none of the scholarships were from historical black university because they thought I was too small. But then at the end of the recruiting period, my high school coach called me and says, I got one more person I want you to visit. I know you've been, you're tired of traveling, but I'll be at your house uh, at about 5 o'clock. And so about five o'clock, two carloads of white guys drove up. And Chuck Curtis was one of the coaches. And he was just a big, tall Texas boy. And he had on a big, tall cowboy hat. And so the coaches came into our living room in the home. And undoubtedly, Coach Fry had done his homework. He came in and started having a discussion with the rest of us. But we talked very little about football. We talked about education. And he says, I want you to come to school, number one, to come get an education, and I want you to play football on my team. Well, the other fascinating thing about uh, Jerry Levias is he never wanted to be a trailblazer. He never wanted to be seen or known as a pioneer. 
And he later said that if Coach Fry had come to him and said, I want you to be the first black athlete in Southwest Conference football history, Jerry Levias said, I wouldn't have gone. I, I wasn't interested in that. Jerry Levias was interested in getting a free education through football. And Hayden Fry made that the center of his recruiting pitch. But if you come to SMU, you're going to get a great education and you're going to get a degree that you're going to be able to use going forward. They really had a great player-coach relationship. They also had something similar to a father-son relationship. I know Jerry looked looked at my dad as a, as a second father and he loved him as if he was his own son. Coach Fry had a way of making you feel that you can go out and you can conquer and do anything. He taught you more about the idea of not letting people thinking that you were less than they were. One of his favorite quotes to me and a lot of the other guys, uh, when he says, he says, I want you guys to move like the eastbound end of a westbound donkey. And I'm going, what is he talking about? And I said, Coach says he wants you to move your ass. So. <laughs> I had to fight through some of the uh, Texas uh, colloquialisms and, you know, his sayings, you know, what's mama think about the job? I, well, you know, I'm 25, Coach. I don't, don't need to get my mom's permission for this, but I uh, figured it out what that meant and some of his other lingo. I remember this, Q. He said, Mac, it's not that complex coaching that defensive line. You either tell them to go straight ahead, right, or left. That's all you got to tell them. <laughs> <laughs> and, then when it's time to, and then when you got to rush that quarterback, you just get out and you're putting them in a, high, in a, in a three point stance, put their butts up in the air, and tell them to see red and smell horse crap and go get that quarterback. <laughs> Hayden Fry had a way of bringing out the best in his coaches and players. Most importantly, he taught them how to be successful, not just in football, but in every aspect of their lives. Hayden Fry was born and raised in Texas. He started off his career as an All-State Honors quarterback before joining the Marine Corps in 1951. He would quarterback for the Quantico Marines until he returned to Odessa, Texas in 1955. He would go on to work as a new assistant coach at Baylor University, finishing the year with a one-point loss to Florida in the Gator Bowl. But it would be his work on the field with Bear Bryant that would have SMU take notice of Fry and his coaching abilities. It was there that he would meet fellow Texan, Jerry Levias. I uh, was born in Boma, Texas, and my father and my mother uh, were from small towns in East Texas. And we were in church every Sunday because grandma lived next door and she said so. The thing that really sealed the deal for Jerry Levias to go to SMU was that Hayden Fry found out that Levias' grandmother lived next door. That uh, like most families, uh, the grandmother has a lot of sway. Coach Fry talked to her and they were over there talking about religion and talking about uh, God and everything else. And my grandmother liked Coach Fry. And that really sold the whole family on, on Coach Fry and SMU. And when Hayden Fry eventually became a coach, he could not understand why he was not allowed to coach black players. And once he started to get into those coaching positions, he would said, if I have an opportunity uh, to coach black players and to get black players uh, into some of these games and into these environments, he was going to do everything he could to do that. I had the pleasure of sitting down with Hayden Fry's children to find out more about what it was like growing up in the Fry home. Randy, myself, Kelly and Abe, and of course Robin, we didn't see our dad when we were growing up. The hours were tremendous. He did a great job in his career, but we never saw him. Our mother raised us. Dad had two families. He had his family at home, and he had his family at the office and the football players and the coaching staff. That's the life of coaching, right? Yeah. Tell me a little bit about Hayden Fry the Marine. You know, Dad was one of those that he felt like, you respect your fellow man no matter what, and you treat people the way you want to be treated. And dad always inferred that with all of us. And I think a lot of that was his Marine Corps upbringing as well. Regardless of what caused us to be beaten, we still weren't good enough to overcome it. And that's what championships are all about. So you didn't play that poorly. You played with great enthusiasm. You played with your heart. If it doesn't hurt you to lose, you shouldn't be on this ball club. But you did yourself proud. You hustled your tail off. And that's all I've ever asked of you and all the coaches. We love every one of you. We played for the Marbles, and we lost. You're great people. We'll win it next year. He would tell you that 
His experience in the Marines was key, key factor for him to be a successful football coach. He learned a lot about the importance of self-discipline and organizational skills. As well as, yeah, no man left behind. Right. It's a team, what, it's a team. Playing for him in North Texas, I couldn't help but notice everything he did for the football program, he was always organized. Hayden accepted his first head football coaching job at SMU. And when Hayden Fry was looking into the SMU job, he basically made SMU promise that if he took the job, he'd be able to recruit black players. Well, that was true. And you know, they had decided that they wanted to recruit uh, my dad and the first black player to enter the Southwest Conference. SMU was not eager to have black players at that time, but they did want Hayden Fry. So they basically told Coach Fry, you can recruit black players on one condition. They have to be able to score at least 1,000 on the SAT academic entrance exams. The white players only needed to score a 750. So the bar was much, much higher for black players. And SMU basically thought there's no way that Coach Fry is going to be able to find a quality black player who can meet those kinds of stringent academic standards. He spent a couple of years searching for the right candidate uh, until he found Jerry Levias. And then I asked him, you know, why, why did you do that, you know, for Jerry Levias? You know, I'm just curious, you know, why did you put your career on the line? Why did you, you know, why was that important for you to do that? And I'll never forget it. And he, he paused for a little bit and he says, you know, I was no longer afraid of the dark. Jerry was everything that they were looking for. He was a, a tremendous athlete and he was an excellent student with upstanding character. There's a story about a Bible character in the Old Testament named Daniel. And Daniel was a captive in Babylonia. And a law was passed that disallowed any public praying to anyone except the king. Well, Daniel had a strong faith in God, and despite the pressure not to do so, he continued to pray publicly, and he ended up being thrown into the lion's den. But he survived by God's grace. What well, Jerry Levias reminds me of Daniel, and despite the pressure not to do so, Jerry signed and accepted the offer to play in the Southwoods Conference. And, and like Daniel, Jerry, he overcame pressure, the criticisms, and the threats to become one of the greatest players in the history of the Southwoods Conference. Racism, isolation, even threats of harm were just some of the obstacles that both men had to navigate through during their time at SMU a task that each man faced and took head on. Well, what people don't really appreciate about uh, when Jerry Levias came to SMU is that it was even more difficult than it would have typically been because freshmen were ineligible at that time. So Jerry Levias came to SMU in the fall of 1965 uh, here's Jerry Levias on a predominantly white campus. He really lived that first year in sort of a, an isolated situation. He went to class, he went to practice, and then he went home. He didn't have much of a social life. He roomed alone. His English professor would talk about how black people had smaller brains than white people. Levias had to accept being in class and being insulted in that way. And it was a really trying year for Jerry Levias. On the football field, it was worse. I, I was very confident in what I could do. But then when they did tackle me, one young man, as I was getting up, jumped in my back with his knees, uh, cracked two ribs, and wedged a vertebra. And that was my first experience of having players of your own team uh, do that to you. And it was a rude awakening. And it was a really trying year for Jerry Levias. But what's interesting is one of the things that really helped Levias that first year was his freshman year, SMU had a, a guest speaker on campus, and it was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Jerry Levias was able to meet Dr. King and shake hands with him, and Martin Luther King Jr. actually gave uh, Jerry Levias a couple of pieces of advice as he was starting his football career. He said, it takes more courage not to fight than to fight. And obviously, Jerry Levias, in the next few years as a varsity football player, he faced a number of situations where it would have been a natural reaction to want to fight and to want to get into a confrontation. Jerry Levi's his sophomore year in 1966, SMU was in a position to finish first place in the Southwest Conference, but they had to beat TCU. If SMU wins the game, they win the championship. About a day or two before that game, 
my father is informed that there's a death threat on Jerry. There was always death threats or some kind of threat that someone didn't want me out there. But this was the first time that the FBI and the police had received the message that if I played in the game, that they would, they would have a sniper in the stands that would kill me. So right before the game, Coach Fry came in and says, Levi, there's been a threat on your life. We've never had one like this before, but the FBI and Fort Worth police and everybody else is involved and we would do what we can to protect you. Despite hearing the threat of being killed, Jerry decides he still wants to play in the game. Well, the game was played and Jerry caught a touchdown pass and SMU ended up winning the game as well as the conference championship. In all my life, I'm not proud of that touchdown that I ran back. I did it out of hate. And I've never really hated before. All the spitting, all the name calling, all the late hits, I never hated. I, I had never felt what it like to hate. And I'm not very proud of that, but it also taught me a lesson. It does not hurt the other person, it hurts you. And I never have wanted that feeling in my life again. I'm, that was the first time, I mean, I've disliked people, but when you've had a taste of hate, you really don't want that. Fortunately, nothing happened to Jerry during that game. I can't help but believe that God had his hand of protection on Jerry that day. You know, I had to go through therapy because I couldn't, I couldn't let him win. I still can't let him win. I always held everything in. You know, they, They'd, they'd spit on me, uh, you know, I'd smile. Coach Fry, he said, if you don't want them to get your goat, don't let them know where it's hid. And that's from his philosophy of Achilles. And he says, you got to stay with what brung you. Stay with God. It wasn't like he was doing it to make me play. He was doing it because he loved me as a person. Despite the challenges that both men faced, Fry and Levias developed a bond that transcended the coach-player relationship. It was as if they were destined to become and stay connected. Some would say that family are those we love and keep in our hearts until the end of time. From day one, there was a sad moment to graduate and not have Coach Fry around every day. It took a lot of adjustments to go from to, uh, college to professional football. And at the same time, I had to live up to my size and my reputation. So he just said, just play like you always play and do what you always do. In 1972, despite having a seven and two record, Hayden Fry was fired from SMU. He would soon be hired as the head coach and athletic director at North Texas State University. After great success, Fry became the 24th head football coach at Iowa in 1979. During his 20 years there, Fry's Hawkeye program had a record of 143 wins, 89 losses, and six ties, changing the landscape of college football in the state of Iowa. Coach Fry turned the Iowa Hawkeye football program into a perennial Big Ten powerhouse. The Hawkeyes had only been to two bowl games in the history of the program. In 20 seasons, the College Football Hall of Famer would lead the program to 14 more, including three Rose Bowl appearances. His innovative passing attack and stand-up tight ends were revolutionary to the game. At the age of 90, Hayden Fry lost his battle with cancer. Everything he did was geared towards winning. When he arrived in Iowa City, he designed a new logo and changed the uniforms to emulate the Super Bowl champion Pittsburgh Steelers. He instantly became a part of the Iowa culture. Fry embraced the farmers of Iowa and created the America Needs Farmers sticker that is still proudly displayed on the players' helmets to this day. His love for the players, coaches, and fans culminates the larger-than-life man who was Hayden Fry. When you meet Coach Fry after three minutes, you feel like you've known him 20 years, 
It's just he has a way of just making you feel comfortable, making you feel at home. Fry's ability to recognize coaching talent was also something to behold. Coaches on his staff included Barry Alvarez, Kirk Ferentz, Bob Stoops, Bill Snyder, and Dan McCartney, just to name a few. Hayden Fry's overall coaching record was 232, 178, and 10. He was a three-time Big Ten Coach of the Year and was inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame in 2003. All of us are gonna die someday. We're all trying to delay it as long as we can, Q. Let's put it off as long as we can. It's inevitable we're all gonna die, but not everybody really lives. What does that mean? People that really live, Hayden Fry really lived. He injected this confidence and belief and trust and excitement and energy in every one of us with the opportunity that he gave all of us as players and coaches. And because of that, we've really got to live. And we've tried to pass it on to many, many people in our families and with friends and players and coaches that we've tried to be around and tried to affect. And thank God we all started at the same time and same place at the University of Iowa with Coach Hayden Fry. More than any of his statistics, Hayden Fry will forever be remembered for the lives that he touched along the way. Jerry Levias is at the top of that list. Until he passed, Coach Fry all, and I talked at least once or twice every month. I just, I just, we all will know exactly how Dad felt about Jerry. He was part of the family. Definitely. I was part of the family, yeah. And it wasn't just because I was a star football player. But that's because of what their dad thought about me and they got to know me and what they thought about me. And that meant more to me than anything. Until this day, it is the same way. I'm part of the family. You know, what's amazing to me is in 2019, when I went to Coach's funeral and you were all there and listening to Jerry speak about your father. In the Bible it says, some trees produce good fruit. Some trees produce bad fruit. But that tree is known by the fruit that it produces. Coach Fry was a great man. He produced great coaches. He produced great friends. He produced great families. And you're wondering why I'm here. With Coach Fry, he and I had a great understanding. Levi, he called me when he loved me. And when I was in trouble, he called me Jerry. He said, Levi, always keep your dauber up. It means keep a positive attitude. Even when they spit on you, call your names. And he was uh, such a great man. I know we knew him as a coach, but I knew him as a coach and a father figure. And to him, I'd like to say, I cannot see the wind at all. I cannot see or feel when it blows a tree, a sways, a flower or a bush. God is like that. You can't see him, you can't touch him, but you know he's there because you see his wonderful works and his goodness everywhere. And Coach Fry is a great man and he was one of God's greatest gifts to a lot of us. May he rest in peace in his new place and God bless him, and I love him forever.